Uh, so I'm going to start off with a really basic overview of, of how braking works in general, like how do you brake a car. So first of all, you have your fluid reservoirs, uh, which store brake fluid. Um, this is because it's a hydraulic system and you're using the fluid to build up pressure. Next, um, well you got to press the brake pedal, so that's the brake pedal, uh, that's where your input force comes from. Uh, this compresses the master cylinders, which create pressure in your system. Uh, these are just pressure transducers, uh, sensors, which we have in our car, which tell us how much pressure we're running in the front lines and the rear lines, since we're running two separate systems. <coughs> these are the calipers, which are located in the wheels and they're on the discs. So the pressure produced there will press the pads against the disc. And this is the disc, which is essentially stopping your wheel. So to go into a bit more detail into some of the basic parts, um, the master cylinder is basically it's just like a piston system. It's pretty simple, compression of a piston. Um, then for your calipers, we run the bigger calipers in the front and the smaller ones in the rear, and I'll get to why we do that uh, in a second. So the bigger ones produce twice as much force as the smaller ones, and these are what the pads look like, which are located inside the calipers, like over here, which is what's pressing onto your disc. And then these are the discs that we're using, which are steel. The holes on the inside are actually just for wheel speed readings, and the holes on the outside, well, it's for a combination of things, reducing weight, uh, increasing heat dissipation, yeah. Other things, uh, so I mentioned brake fluid. Brake fluid is basically an oil that has uh, a really um, high boiling point. There's different kinds, we use DOT4. Basically they vary in terms of chemical composition, uh, boiling points, and compressibility. So we run a really hard brake pedal, so the fluid is pretty incompressible. And the reason you want a really high boiling point is because your brakes often get pretty hot, and once you boil a fluid, you get uh, air bubbles inside, and air bubbles are very easily compressible, and we don't want that, that means your pedal gets really soft. Uh, then the hard lines that we use inside the car are made of copper and that's just pretty easy to bend so we can manufacture it ourselves. And on the outside we use stainless steel braided soft lines. Uh, and that's because you have to accommodate things like suspension travel and steering so that's why you got to have soft lines on the outside. And then to connect it all together we use AN fittings, usually aluminum. Okay, so now we're going to get into some basic braking calculations. The most important concept, first of all, is uh, weight transfer. So you've probably noticed that when you brake your car pretty hard, you have a tendency to go forward. Um, so that's like a moment that you get when you brake. Um, I'm going to move on to the board now since it'll be easier. the front so we're going this way. Um, so you have your front normal force, your rear normal force, uh, then this will be your braking force. And then let's say your center of gravity is here, then you have the weight of your car and so that's like counteracting this normal force. And you have this force here, which is kind of the counteraction of your braking force, and this is why you get like this moment forward when you brake. So, because of this moment, um, you're going to have weight transfer to the front of your car, which is like the opposing moment. So, if we call this, uh, let's call this force front, force rear, uh, weight. Okay, so. If we do a sum of moments about this point right here, and the sum of moments everywhere has to be zero, so you'll take your force rear times this distance, which is your wheelbase, 
and then you're going to subtract uh, the weight of your car times half your wheel days, and you're going to add this force, and we know that F equals MA. Um, so this is this force is actually MA, and it's going to be multiplied by your CG height, which is this distance here. So then if you solve for uh, the force in the rear, you're going to get FR equals uh, your weight over 2 minus So, weight over 2, that's assuming that you're starting with a 50-50 weight dis distribution on your car. And then this is effectively the weight transfer. So in the rear, uh, you're reducing your weight, and in the front, you're adding your weight. So it's basically the same calculation, just the other way around. Okay, then, um, I don't know if I should get into this, but... From your normal forces, basically, you can calculate your front and rear braking torques. So that's basically a function of the wheel radius, as well as the coefficient of friction of your tires. Uh, so what is the coefficient of friction of your tires? That's a complicated question. Uh, yeah, Gary could probably talk to you for like two hours about it. Um, but basically, it depends on the tires that you're running, uh, the track surface, the track temperature, variety of factors like that, and usually I estimate it to be about the same as the maximum deceleration of the vehicle if I'm doing the calculation, because the greater coefficient of friction, the greater uh, deceleration you'll be able to obtain. Um, torques. So that's how much torque you need to walk your wheels actually. Then from the torque you're going to calculate how much pressure that requires at your calipers. And that's basically a function of your disc radius, your caliper piston radius, uh, the number of calipers, and the number of pistons per caliper. Um, basically it's like a pressure equals force over area type of calculation. And then you're going to know your pressure in the front lines, the pressure in the rear lines, and then you can convert that back to force in your master cylinders. So then force equals pressure times area. You know the area of your master cylinder bore. Then you know what pressure you need in the front, you know what pressure you need in the rear. That gives you a ratio of your front to rear braking. And to get that in the car, we have something called a balance bar. Uh, so basically it's like, there's a bar, and you have one master cylinder attached on this side, one master cylinder attached on either side. Let's say this is your midpoint. Well, you can vary the distance between each master cylinder, and that will give vary how much force you're putting into each master cylinder. Uh, there's also something called a pedal ratio, which is how much force you're getting in your master cylinders as opposed to how much force you're putting in with your foot. And that's basically just like basic geometry. So let's say your pedal is vertical like this, and we mount our master cylinders, well, maybe even steeper than that. But it basically comes down to a geometry calculation, and we get a pedal ratio of around 5. So force that you're putting in is multiplied by 5 in the master cylinders. Okay. Moving on. Um, so usually you want to kind of think about how much force you'll need to stop the car or lock the wheels because at competition we have something called a brake test where you have to lock the wheels. So I kind of do braking calculations based on that since that's kind of like our maximum uh, braking, I guess. Um, so the input force I usually use is 75 pounds. Anyways, I already talked about the coefficient of friction with the tires on the road. The other coefficient of friction that comes into play is the friction coefficient between your pads and your disc. And the way that we know that is um, 
from manufactured data, but also from brake dynamometer testing, which I'll talk about later. Okay. So, as I mentioned, um, during the brake test, we want to lock our wheels. And the way that you lock your wheels is when your braking force that you're inputting to your wheels is greater than the braking capacity. And so we know that friction force, which is effectively your braking force, is mu times normal force, right? So you're going to have more braking capacity in the front since you have more load in the front and less in the rear. Um, so if you look at this graph, the front pressure, which is just a function of like how much force you're inputting into your pedal, is the blue. Uh, so it's going up as you're increasing your driver input force. And the rear pressure, same thing, it's going up as you're increasing your driver input force. The reason they're not the same is because of uh, the bias bar. So we are running more front bias. Uh, we're, yeah, that thing I, this thing I mentioned before. Um, then in purple, you have the lock of pressure in the rear. And the lock of pressure in the rear is always decreasing the more force you're inputting. Because the more force you're inputting, the higher deceleration you're getting. The more deceleration, the more weight transfer. So the less braking capacity you have in the rear because you have less normal force. While in the front, it's actually doing the opposite. Uh, you're getting more, you're, 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 the green is the lock of pressure in. Okay, now we get into aero. So obviously having aero on the car changes things a bit in terms of braking. Basically, aero produces downforce. Effectively, it's adding extra weight that you don't have to brake, but that increases your braking capacity. Um, and the important thing to note is that it's a function of speed, because the higher the speed, the more downforce you're making. So the reason you're increasing your braking capacity is because of this formula right here. So you might ask, why don't we just build heavier cars and then you'll be able to achieve like 3G braking? Well, that's because, well, wrong reason is because your coefficient of friction is more or less decreasing the more load you put on your tires. Right, Gary? Okay, well, <laughs> maybe it's not that simple, but basically, yeah. Well, there's other reasons you don't build a heavy car, but anyways. Um, and the point of this graph is just to show that, um, okay, so on this axis you have your deceleration, on this axis you have your velocity. And so this one right here is your front lock of pressure because it's increasing with your deceleration. And this graph here is your rear lock of pressure because it's also decreasing with deceleration. However, you can see that when you look at the velocity axis, this is actually uh, slightly quadratic because downforce varies as a function of v squared. And basically, it demonstrates that aero is increasing your braking capacity because your lock up pressure is now uh, quadratic instead of going linearly down. Okay, um, another thing that we do on the brake system is the brake dynamometer. So just to give everyone a little overview of how it works. Um, so at the top we have a linear actuator system and this is pushing into the master cylinders creating the pressure. Uh, and it's connected to the pressure transducer which is right here. So you're controlling how much pressure you're inputting into your system. Uh, what else? The other things you have here is a temperature sensor on the disc, which we also run on the car. Uh, your brake disc is over here, and your caliper is over here. So when you use this, oh, I forgot to mention. I forgot to mention that back here you have a motor, which is spinning this disc. And here in the middle, in between, there is a torque sensor. So you're spinning your disc. And then you apply a braking force. And when you apply the braking force, the motor keeps spinning the disc at the same speed. So then your torque sensor gives you your torque reading that the motor had to input in order to counteract your braking force. So that torque reading is equal to your braking torque. And we use the dynamometer uh, 
for a few things. First of all, it was useful in comparing two different pads and determining their coefficient of friction, which we were able to compare to manufacturer data. We also used it to compare different disc designs. Uh, we used it to characterize our calipers, the front ones versus the rear ones. And you can also use it to look at temperature effects, so how braking torque or your coefficient of friction varies with temperature. So this is just an example of how you would run uh, a test. So let's say you decide that you're looking at 250 degrees Celsius. So you heat up your disc to like let's say 300 just by braking. Then you let the temperature drop to 250. Once you're at 250, then you can start collecting data. You apply your braking force and so you get uh, your pressure reading and your torque reading. And you can do that for like three seconds let's say. And then once again you drop down to 250, repeat, so that you get multiple readings at that temperature. Uh, for the for the brakes, obviously there's a physical limit to how they can get, but is there an optimal temperature that you want them at? Like the tires, you would want them at a certain temperature before? Uh, I can't tell you about the tires, but I could tell oh, you yeah, yeah. a bit more about the disc. So yeah, we do use the, the dynamometer. You can get um, temperature versus, let's say, coefficient of friction measurements. So. Of course, you want the highest coefficient of friction since that way you're increasing your braking power. Um, however, we don't really control that because when we race, like let's say during endurance, the brakes go to like 300, 400 degrees Celsius sometimes. And it's something we could definitely look more into. So it's not like we're actively being like, okay, we want to run our brakes at 250 because 250 is the best temperature. No. I mean, it's something you could do if you started looking at like ventilated brake discs, but we don't do it. But yeah, there is an optimal temperature in theory. Okay. Did you happen to look at what kind of temperatures we saw for like FSG endurance, for instance? Uh, I think so. And I think it went up to like 400. So. So yeah, top is speed, bottom is temperature. So the maximum on that graph is 420. And this is, I think, FSG. That's, uh, the, that's the whole thing, it looks like. No, this is the first half. Somehow there's three halves, I don't know how. <laughs> Second half, yeah, temperature drops, which we've seen before also, tends to drop in the second half. I don't know what the third half is, probably another wrong or I don't know. Maybe it's up from maybe it's from another journey. But this one was till four forty. Anyways, you get the general idea. Interesting. Anything else? Yeah. And you'll say that like carbon ceramics are better. Like, is there a reason why, like, why exactly are they better? And like, we just not exactly expensive, or is that a? I don't know why they're better. Um, the reason we don't use them is, yeah, mostly because they're really expensive. Okay. Um, there are other disc materials though, yeah, so we use steel just because it's easiest for us. Easy to manufacture, we get it laser cut. Uh, however, obviously you could look into other materials like ductile iron, for instance. It's probably heat dissipation properties that you might guess, but I might be wrong. That's it.